Welcome to Bedhampton Church. Contact us at www.bedhampton.church. But for now, let's continue that journey with this input. Well, we've made it, haven't we? We've made it to uh, Matthew 25. Um, we're at the very end there. Um, like I say, it seems like we've been doing it for a while, um, which we have. Um, I'm aware that after you know, Matthew 25 does come Matthew 26 and Easter, you know, Gethsemane, you know, um, the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, all of that is there. Uh, but of course, we'll be heading into that in Easter. So I thought we'd finish our journey through Matthew here in Matthew 25. These words in Matthew are just, they're an absolute masterpiece. Jesus is speaking in apocalyptic language here. Um, so you want to be thinking more Tom and Jerry um, than perhaps, I don't know, Wuthering Heights and drama. Okay, more Tom and Jerry, more bashing over the head with a mallet than a lovely romantic drama. So not that subtle thing, but this is black and white stuff we're talking about here. He begins with this warning in the early verses that um, the parable of the ten virgins. Speaking of five wise ones with their oil prepared to wait for the bridegroom and the five foolish ones, of course, um, who messed up and didn't have enough oil. Um, he is saying in that parable, um, be prepared for Jesus' return. Be prepared as though it might be tomorrow. Be prepared to meet Jesus as though it might be tomorrow. And we all hear stories of people gone far too quickly up where it actually becomes tomorrow. And then on the other end of this um, chapter, he tells uh, the story of these sheep and goats, the separation of them. Some that he welcomes into the fold, others that he sends away. And so there's this bookend of parables, which is then summed up uh, with our parable in the middle. And that's what I want to concentrate on on today. I get a few man crushes on living theologians, as you know. There's a couple. John Mark Comer, as you know, you'll get bored of me quoting. Um, and N.T. Wright is another man crush for me as well, uh, theologian. But also, one of my favourite living theologians is a chap called Tim Mackey. Um, apart from looking a bit like a hipster, you can forgive him for that. But he's a, And he has this understanding of being prepared meaning that we are to be in a state of readiness. And he says this, that a state of readiness is to, is to be in every moment, every day, charged with significance. Every person, every relationship, every conversation, meaningful. That's a challenge for someone like me. But that's being in a state of readiness, he says. So with that in mind, Jesus comes to us now and explains what it is to have a life to the full using this parable of the gold bags, or what we used to call in the old day the par- parable of the talents, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, the problem with the word talents, of course, is it has a different meaning in English, doesn't it? So uh, I quite like the use of the gold bags. As <laughs> and um, we begin, don't we? It says, it will, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. So a man is going on a journey. The ma- we later discover it's the master. Pop quiz. Who is this man? <coughs> you know the answer to that question. Every time, the answer to who is this person is, it's Jesus. Come on. <laughs> it is God, isn't it? This man, this master, is God. And the answer, as you know, as I tell the school guys, Every answer to every question I ever ask is Jesus. <laughs> so it is Jesus. So this man, and so who are the servants? Us. 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 The servants are us, aren't they? Uh, not rocket science. Like I say, this is Tom and Jerry stuff, not, you know, <laughs> not Shakespeare. So uh, be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To the one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. So the master goes on a journey. He gathers all his expectations and his wealth together and he distributes amongst his servants equally. No, he doesn't, does he? He doesn't do that. He gives one five, one two, 
and another one. And these bags of gold are like ridiculous. There are millions of pounds, really, in these bags of gold. That's the point. It is real comic stuff. You know. He's making a point. One bag of gold alone would be enough for plenty of people. It's millions of pounds. So whether it's one or five, it really doesn't matter. It's a crazy amount of money. And the cartoon continues. Because this passage is about how we live our life to the full. And the master knows each of our abilities. So he knows who can cope with one bag of gold. He knows who can cope with five bags of gold. Who can cope with two bags of gold. He knows how we can cope with the resources that he gives us. Who can cope with so much and who can cope with more. So the bags symbolise our time. They symbolise our energies. Uh, they symbolise our, our skill sets. They symbolise money as well. And God knows who can cope with what. That's the point. So let's take a look at what happens then. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five and said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. Now see, I've gained five more. Rocking, he's saying, Dad, you gave me five bags of gold. I've brought you five more. Father God, you gave me billions of blessings and a life to live. I have used those billions of blessings to bless you and to make you worthy in the eyes of other people. To bless you and to encourage others. Dad, I've done that. And his response is very good, isn't it? It's straight away. It's, well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many. Come and share your master's happiness. You are amazing, God says. You've done incredibly well. Now come and enjoy. What is mine is yours. Come and join in with the celebration. And then we have the other guy, the man who received two bags of gold. The one who had received two bags of gold also came. He said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. Awesome. <laughs> he said, look, Dad, you gave me two. I received, I've got two more for you. You gave me millions of blessings in my life, and I use that to glorify you and bring millions of blessings to others. Fantastic. And God's response to that, the Master's response to that is, that's amazing. Not quite as good as going over there. <laughs> no, he doesn't say that, does he? He doesn't say, he doesn't use comparison. Comparison is a human thing. God says, actually, exactly the same words, doesn't he? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. Come and share. He's deliberately chosen the same words. It doesn't matter whether your giftings, your opportunities, your ability to respond is five bags or two bags. It's what you do with that. It's not about the amount that you offer, whether that's money or time or offerings. It's about what you do with that. I nearly broke down in tears at church last week. I don't know if you were there last week. But Jill was preaching. Um, and she shared about Esther, her daughter. Esther, her daughter, has significant uh, learning disabilities. And Jill shared what was a holy moment in Esther's life. She, uh, she said that Esther held a crucifix with Jesus on it in her hand. And she simply said... Jesus. And Jill said, yes. And then Esther said, Bro. It's a holy moment. Yeah. It's the gospel spoken. It's the truth spoken out loud. It's one bag of gold given and two returned as glorious worship to our God. Esther is living her life to the full. It's a holy moment. It's not about it's not about how we measure things, it's about our response. But of course there is this other side to the coin that we can't brush over, isn't there? Then the man who had received one bag of gold, he came and said, Master, 
I know that you are a hard man, harvesting what you have not sown and gathering what you have not scattered seed. Where you have not scattered seed. That's a bit odd. That is not the Jesus I speak of when I stand up here every week, is it? The hard man. We've not even seen a hard man in this story so far. There's no hard man or mention. There's no, there's no even actions of a hard man mentioned at this point. This guy somehow has bought into a lie that this rich master must be a hard man. He couldn't have, he couldn't have had all these gifts out of a good one. He must have been a hard man. He must have used people and abused people. He has bought into a lie. Some other people in our world buy into lies about Father God, don't they? God's an angry God. God's a bitter God. People buy into lies about our Father God. This man hasn't even done the sensible thing of putting the money in the bank. He's been blinded so much by his misconception of the master that he hasn't even done the sensible thing. Some people are blinded so much by their perception of God they don't even do the sensible thing of investigating the truth. They might have come across someone who said they were a Christian and acted in a way that wasn't godly, that wasn't Jesus-like. And they've been blinded by the true love of God. They might simply have fallen into the lies of the world that say, actually, this is this was me, wasn't it? Actually, a life to the full with a big house, a fast car, and as many holidays as you can have. They might have been blinded by that, but whatever way they've been blinded, they fall into this lie about Father God that doesn't they don't understand that He loves them and wants them to love others. And so when Jesus shows up and says Love God, love others. They are blind to that. That is this one person that we see. Reminds me of um, what we used to do with a family. I've got three children, three grown children. And they're, they're all married now, so they're hardly children, are they? But, um, and we, but when they were younger, when they were Jack's age or, or whatever, uh, we would go out to a restaurant. Uh, one of our favourite things in the family is to go out and eat there. Um, and then we'd go and have great food, we'd have great drinks and conversation and swims and a time together. And it would be absolutely awesome. It would be family life to the full. And I would wallow in being the father in that environment. And I would wallow in that family life to the full. And then when we finished, I'd write a check out and I'd put a good tip on there. And I would not begrudge one penny of that meal. But lest you think that my children were perfect, there were the other times. Where just before we were about to go out, the squabble broke out. <laughs> Susie is dealing with that, and I'm having to deal with something I've with one. And then someone's having to be dis- disciplined, and then I just walked into my office and seen like, my whole office strewn all over the office where Jack has gone mad. <laughs> and we had to deal with that before we go. But then we've still got this appointment this meal books. So we're driving down at 45 miles an hour <laughs> <laughs> to, this, to this restaurant. We get there, we sit down, we eat the same food, we drink the same drinks, but the conversation is empty. It's not family life before. I get to the end of the meal, I write a check out, I just begrudge every penny in that check. And we go home. Same food, same drink, same restaurant, same opportunity to have family life in the full. And yet we said, no, we don't want that. Blinded by what had gone before. The chef didn't come out and say, you will enjoy this food. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the maitre d' didn't come over and say, you will have a nice conversation together. We just went home and missed family life in the full. And for me, there's a great analogy in that here. Because we get opportunities to have life to the full, don't we? Just like the person with one bag. Everyone gets that opportunity. But Jesus doesn't say, you will have this. Jesus says, there's an opportunity to have this. There's an opportunity to have it for the first time. There's an opportunity to have it again to return to him. There's an opportunity to have life to the full. 
Jesus forces no one, but welcomes everyone. And so as we come into land on this, and as we come into land on Matthew as well, and Jesus comes into land on his story, it begs one question for anyone. For those of us who call ourselves apprentices to Jesus, disciples of Jesus, we have the same question as those who have not yet made that decision. And for those who haven't yet made that decision, they have that same question as well. How are you doing with your bags of gold? How are you doing with what you can get? The opportunities you've received? I don't know. I know how I'm doing. I know how Esther's doing. She'll be dancing before the Lord. I can see the party happening now. But how are you doing? What's your next step? You have been listening to Bedhampton Church. Our prayer is that this helps you journey with Jesus and serve your community by sharing God's love and friendship. Subscribe and join us for more discussion at www.bedhampton.church. All material creative commons copyright. Contact us for more details.